Hi, everybody. I am so excited this week because with us is my good friend, Lisa Gibbons, uh, who I've adored for, we're just thinking about it, 20 years. Um, Lisa is a very well-known television personality. She's an author. Her latest book is Fierce Optimism. She founded Lisa's Care Connection. And I know many of you know her, but I had the opportunity to spend the day with her. Uh. I'm just grateful. Thank you. Welcome to the Brain Warriors Way. This is really a wonderful opportunity. I've I've been such a fan, as you know, of your work for so long, uh, even before you scanned my brain a decade ago. Wow. So you know me well, and you know my brain even better. (laughs) I do. So I was on your show 1999 when my book, Change Your Brain, Change Your Life, came out, and you said to me, so I read the book, and there's 300 stories in here. Yes, right. (laughs) And, you know, there's just no end when it comes to the brain. And one of the things that you're really passionate about is Alzheimer's disease. Why? My mother and my grandmother both had Alzheimer's disease and died of complications from Alzheimer's. And so I became one of those reluctant recruits, many of whom become your patients, uh, the worried well that we would call ourselves. Uh, wanting to understand what my mother was going through and looking through a prism that didn't look so rosy of, oh no, uh, does that mean I'm headed in that direction? So wanting to really be a good caregiver for my mom, I, you know, like most people, you, you just, your blind spot is what you don't know. And I, I didn't understand this very confounding brain disease. And your grandmother had it, too. And what do you remember about that? I remember my mother. The first thing I remember about my grandmother was loving her so much, this this vibrant Southern woman who was, you know, big bosoms, big laugh, big wonderful hugs, and she made great biscuits. And the first time I remember knowing something was wrong with Granny was when she said, well, I can't find the biscuits. And I said, well, aren't they in the oven? And she found them in a dresser drawer in a bedroom. Oh, no. And that was the first sign that something's wrong with Granny. And then watching my mother care for her and argue with her sister, my aunt, about what was best for their mom and all of the struggles that many of you know very well about caregiving was so instructive to me, but I I, I didn't know then nor did I ever want to let myself believe that my mother would also walk that same path. She did. And when did you begin to notice it in your mother? We thought that my mother was drinking too much, which I believe she was because I think she was self-medicating with wine because she was confused and she wasn't remembering things. Um, I noticed her behavior change that I attributed to drinking too much and to slowing down. Like her life's not big enough and exciting enough, but she's the one, Daniel, who said, I paid this bill three times. Something is wrong. Wow. She lined us all up, um, my brother, my sister, my dad, myself, and she said, look, when I can no longer call you by name, uh, you know, I, I want you to, I don't want to live with you, first of all. She gave us her marching orders. I don't want to live with you or your brother or your sister, and I want you kids to help Daddy know when it's time to to let me go. And by that, she meant, because of her experience taking care of her mom, that uh, she wanted to live in a residential community that was specially designed for people with, with memory loss. And so she picked out a place herself. That's pretty remarkable. Well, you come from remarkable women. Thank you. I think that's certainly true. Thank you for that. True. And what was going on inside you as you watched your grandmother and then you watched your mother? And was your mother in South Carolina? Yes. Uh, my family is all still in South Carolina, as is a big part of my heart. The biggest moment of truth for me Uh, came at my granny's funeral. My mother had already been diagnosed, still functioning in the early stages, but 
She had dressed herself for the funeral that day, and as is very common, uh, she, the buttons were wrong, her makeup wasn't quite right, and my mother was an impeccably beautiful woman. But she was struggling. And I looked at my mother, put her mother to rest, and that was the first time that I went, oh, wait, sh sh scratch this track. Um, you know, you love looking at your legacy. You love looking at what you inherit from the generations that came before you, but no one wants to inherit this, this disease that steals your mind. And that was probably the first time that I felt um, the loneliness of loving someone with, with Alzheimer's. Say more about that. It's a very isolating disease, as you know. Uh, you know, and until you're in the club, that no one wants to, to which no one wants to belong. Until you're in that group, uh, you you don't know that it feels so stigmatizing and so um, so lonely, and there's so much negativity because it feels hopeless. And honestly, that's why I love your work so much because it is not hopeless, and um, that's that's part of my worldview. Why I wrote Fierce Optimism. I you know I I believe in our ability to find ways to make the most of what we have. And when you love someone or care for someone with Alzheimer's, the, the, the caregiver uh, often gets sick or fails at a faster rate and dies before their diagnosed loved one because the stress is so overwhelming. So one of the statistics I wrote about in Memory Rescue is 15% of the caregivers of people who have Alzheimer's disease have Alzheimer's or another form of dementia themselves. Mm. And so getting consistent care is often really hard. And now an epidemic in our country is there are people by themselves. Right. And so loneliness is massive. And it's actually one of the risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. But if you're headed to the dark place and your family's not there, and I, I did, um, you and I have talked about the big NFL study I did. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I learned, there's a very high incidence of dementia in former football players. Right. But often as they're going into a dementia place, they're angry they're irritable, they're not as responsible because their brain's deteriorating. But their spouses misinterpret that as they don't love me anymore, I'm not important to them, they don't care. And so they actually go away. And leaving um, these people sometimes on their own, which is a nightmare. A nightmare, yeah, the, the lack of socialization is really, really um, a, a very difficult place. And, but the numbers in our society, Dr. Amen, are overwhelming. I mean, you say in the next 25 years, what will the rate be? It's gonna triple. Triple, triple in 25 years. That's our lifetimes. Yeah, so it's almost six million people now and go up to 18 million And I people. always say that this is a woman's disease because as you know, women get diagnosed at a greater frequency than men. And women are more often the caregivers than men. And it's such a conundrum. We don't really know why yet, do we? Well, we have, some, of theories. we have some clues that when estrogen goes low, blood flow to the brain goes low. Mm -hmm. And so since male brains weren't birthed with much estrogen, they're not as dependent on it. Uh, and so there's there's clearly a hormonal piece to it. So when people express fear or concern about estrogen replacement um, being a cancer risk, you respond by saying what? Yes, if you take horse estrogens, it's a cancer risk, right? The, the Women's Health uh, Initiative study that came out, goodness, almost 15 years ago, I think. And women just threw away the estrogen they were taking. But it was synthetic estrogen. 
and I have not seen an increased cancer risk with bioidentical hormones. Now, it depends on what your genetics are mm -hmm. and your risk for things like breast cancer and uterine cancer. But you have to weigh that against, well, what happens to my brain? Yeah. But hormones aren't the only factor. We'll talk about the 11 risk factors because they're so interesting and so important. Um, when we come back, we're going to talk about what Lisa has learned from her own brain and from her search on how to not have the same legacy mm. of your grandmother and your mother. Great. Stay with us. Welcome back. Thank I'm you. I'm here with my friend Lisa Gibbons, and we're talking about something that's near and dear to both of our hearts. Yes. Um, so now that you know that you're at risk, um, some people would go, well, I'm at risk, so... Sign me up early. Let's live it up. Yeah. What do you think? I think the definition of live it up then needs to include, okay, what can, what can I do to change the path of what could look like a, a predestined future? You know, I'm a big one on saying, you know, I don't want to borrow tomorrow's troubles today, but I certainly don't want to be naive. And I think for those of us, and there are so many millions of us uh, who have relatives with Alzheimer's disease that, disease that put us at greater risk, um, we need to recognize that everyone who has a brain is at risk. It is a false sense of security, right? To think that I'm never going to get it. I don't have a family member that has it. So that's one thing is, um, yes, we are at greater risk. But, you know, if you have a brain, then you, you are at risk for these diseases. Every, probably while we've even been talking on this podcast, the numbers have changed. But what is it now? Every 58 seconds or something, everyone is diagnosed. I mean, someone is diagnosed with a new case. And uh, as we've said before, that many of those new cases are women. I've learned that early intervention, the sooner you know better, the sooner you can do better. And the sooner you can begin to change the things that are within your ability to alter and there are a whole bunch of them. There are a whole bunch of them, which you've helped us realize. Yes, thank you very much. There are a bunch of them. So when you say we're all at risk, if you live until you're 85, you have a 50% risk of being diagnosed with Alzheimer's or some form of dementia. So you have a 50% risk of having lost your mind. I'm not okay with that. No. Because I want to live until I'm 85, especially the closer I get to it. <laughs> and, um, yes. I mean, to look at, if, if, you're, if you're watching this and you think about the people you know in your life, or, or maybe yourself, like look to your left, look to your right, you know, the, you're either going to need a caregiver or be a caregiver. And being in denial, which our society tends to want to just go into this hole, doesn't help anything. Yes, now we'll just get distracted by our phone and <laughs> what latest tweet That's that right. happened. All right, so the one thing I discovered that if you want to keep your brain healthy or rescue it if you're headed to the dark place, you have to prevent or treat the 11 major risk factors that steal your mind. I'm hoping people understood what you said, 11 risk factors. One of them is genetics. One of them there is genetics. There are 10 others. And if you're not paying attention, um, one of them will get you when it didn't have to. Mm -hmm. So we came up with a mnemonic that we like called Bright Minds. And the B in Bright Minds is blood flow. Low blood flow is the number one brain imaging 
predictor of Alzheimer's disease. And how many brains have you scanned now? 150,000. So you kind of have an indication of what this is like, what this means. Low blood flow. For somebody like, like me, um, and I, you've looked at my brain, you know that that's an issue that was in my brain. Um, that means to rescue it, I need to do more exercise. Let's talk about all those things because we said there's lots of things you can do. Let's talk about things you can do for your blood so, flow. So know if you have the blood flow risk. So yes, you can get a scan. SPECT is a blood flow study. But also if you have things like hypertension or any form of heart disease, heart attack, heart arrhythmia, cerebral vascular disease like a stroke, mm -hmm. um, for men if they have erectile dysfunction because if you have blood flow problems anywhere, it means they're Everywhere. everywhere and if you don't exercise and so the things to do exercise is the obvious one because it increases blood flow so you want to keep your cardiovascular system healthy because your brains two percent of your body's weight but it uses 20 percent of the blood flow and oxygen in your body yeah. so it's the most expensive real estate in your body but there are other things too like ginkgo and so our supplements like brain and memory power boost, ginkgo and venpositine, both increase blood flow in the brain. Foods like beets and cayenne pepper and rosemary increase blood flow. Sugar decreases blood flow. Caffeine decreases blood flow. Nicotine decreases blood flow. And, you know, I always say brain health is three things. Brain envy, you got to care about it. Um, avoid things that hurt it and do things that help it. So for blood flow, it's exercising and um, eating foods that increase blood flow. That love you back, like you always say. Eat, eat foods that you love that love you back. Right. I'm not going to be in an abusive relationship again with anything, especially not food that I can completely control. The now, if I may, with blood flow and all these other risk factors, these changes and the damage they may be doing to your brain start decades before you begin to notice. Isn't that the one result? big thing we've learned with thing. all the research is that Alzheimer's disease doesn't just show up at 58 or at 78. It, I'd scanned a 59-year-old woman and her brain was clearly Alzheimer's. And the scan pattern is bilateral, means both sides, parietal lobe decreases, temporal lobe decreases. Odds are she had negative changes in her brain in her 20s. In her 20s. So if you're a young person thinking, well, I'll worry about this when I need to worry about this, this is the time to begin to put in those protective things, right? That will, the changes that Absolutely. you make. There, This is your insurance. Um, so the R is retirement and aging. When you stop learning, your brain starts dying. And there's some other risk factors there. Loneliness. Um, having failed in school. So having learning problems because then you don't love learning mm. and you don't continue it throughout your life. If you're in a job that does not require lifelong learning, you're at a higher risk. If you have high iron levels, in your blood because it prematurely ages you. So this is one of the few instances where leeches were actually a good thing because <laughs> donating, um, donating blood actually helps to get oh. rid of excess iron. So I have to do that because I've always had high iron levels. Interesting. And so I don't eat much red meat because it has higher concentrations of iron. Hmm. And so- But you do talk about protein throughout the day for your brain. Protein and healthy fat because it'll balance your blood sugar mm -hmm. and you won't be overweight. Um, and you'll have good focus. Um, the big strategy though for retirement and aging is lifelong learning. Yeah. It is 15 minutes a day. Do something new. And what I want um, people to do, especially you, is coordination exercises. So yeah. dancing so ballroom dancing, if you can get Steven to do it with you, is He's so off camera here. good for you. Um, well, good for you because of the hand-to-eye, because there's music involved, which is positive. There's socialization. There's skin-to-skin -skin touch. There's lots of There's exercise. Positives. And there's the shame that some of us feel after we do it. 
That's the piece we have to take off the table. Is <laughs> there is no, um, this is not a dance Olympics. If you're not good at it, and, you know, for highly successful people, it's like, oh, we don't want to do things we're not good at. But we, we need to get over that. Because if right. we're not good at it, then that means our brain actually needs to do it more so we can develop a part of the brain we're not used to developing. So we've got a bigger bell curve of achievement than people who are good at it. You do. Um, so new learning. The I in Bright Minds is inflammation. Mm -hmm. And inflammation comes from the Latin word to set a fire. And when you have high inflammation in your body, it's like you have a low-level fire that's destroying your organs. And high inflammation is associated with dementia and depression. Mm -hmm. And we are so inflamed in this society because we have low levels of omega-3 fatty acids. I did a study here on 50 consecutive patients who came here, measured their omega-3 fatty acid levels. If they weren't taking fish oil, 49 of them were low. 98% of them Goodness. were low. And so I think all of us should be taking omega-3 fatty acids and fish oil, or if you're vegetarian, using algae-based products to help you with that. Mm -hmm. um, if you have any form of gum disease, you have high inflammatory markers. And quite frankly, I never really cared about my teeth because I was busy. And then I read study after study. Yes. Periodontal disease is associated with dementia. It's associated with heart disease. It's associated with depression. I'm like, I'm not okay with that. No, especially when that's, a, that's an easy fix. It's that's an, a habit. It's a habit. And so when I went to my dentist last year and he's like, you just have the best gums. I felt like I was seven, and I wanted to put the report card on my refrigerator. Gold star. I called Tana, and I'm like, my teeth are great. And she's like, seriously, is that what makes you happy? Yes. <laughs> yes, that's what made me happy. Um, turmeric or curcumins. We make something called brain curcumins. It has an anti-inflammatory mm -hmm. effect, and you have to kill the processed foods, because processed foods are loaded with omega-6 fatty acids, corn, soy, all genetically modified, all raised with pesticides. But even if it wasn't, it's omega-6s are pro-inflammatory. They're called fall fats because they put you toward the end of your life, where omega-3s are spring fats because they help keep you young. And along with inflammation is getting your gut right, because when your gut's not right, you end up with this thing called leaky gut, which actually causes inflammation mm -hmm. throughout your body. And uh, But very treatable things that you're, that you're talking about. All of this. Mm -hmm. None of this is hard. You just have to fall in love with your brain, and then G is genetics. And what I have come to believe is genes aren't a death sentence, they should be a wake-up call. And For sure. if you have grandma and your mom, it's like, okay, I need to pay attention to this because, you know, as much as I love my four children, I never want to live with them. I never <laughs> want them taking my keys from me. I don't want them deciding what I wear. <laughs> no, I want to be independent. But that means, you know, I'm 64. I need to be thinking about it now, yes. not when I'm 84 and headed to the dark place or further down the road to the dark place. But, but even if you have the E4 gene, even if you have two of the E4 genes, so that's what we think of as sort of the highest risk or one of the highest risks, well, that means you have a tenfold increased risk. Well, it's tenfold from 2.5%. Mm -hmm. So that means you have a 25% risk, which means you have a 75% chance you're, something else is going to kill you. So it's not dire, but if it's me, oh, I'm serious. You want to mitigate that risk you because want to mitigate you can. It. And they found for people who have the E4 gene, exercise actually works better for them. Getting on an anti-inflammatory diet works better better for them. New learning works better for them. And so for me, that's motivating. That's very motivating. To do the right thing, having, you know, a, a nihilistic 
uh, viewpoint. It's like, oh, well, there's... Because, you know, when I first started scanning, I was so excited. I'd go to national meetings. And, and I had this one doctor from Washington University. And he goes, well, if you have that risk, why would you want to know? Right. And I hear it all the time. And I'm like, are you nuts? If you knew a train was going to hit you... Wouldn't you want to try to get out, get of, the out of the way? <laughs> it's like, are you insane? It's like, come on, let's be serious. But, you know, you understand it. I understand it. You know, we're, we're fearful of the unknown. That's why if you name it and claim it and start an action plan, um, that fear can just, you know, devolve into something much more manageable. You can replace that with feeling how, wonder how wonderfully proactive you are. Well, I'd rather be in the fight because I yeah. love my life and my wife and my mission and my kids and my grandkids. I mean, there's so many reasons to love and I don't want to be a burden. That's a When one. we come back, we're going to talk about more of the risk factors. Welcome back. So we're talking about Alzheimer's disease and how to avoid it, uh, how to do the right things. And we talked about blood flow, retirement and aging, inflammation, genetics, head trauma. And big lesson I learned early from imaging is mild traumatic brain injury ruins people's lives and nobody knows about it. And Like someone has a car wreck, someone falls off a bike or... You're talking the, 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 even as a child. Or they fell off a horse. Yep. Well, you know, what killed Superman was a horse. Yep. They played football, mm -hmm. hockey, uh, soccer, and they had header drills, which, you know, when you think about it from my perspective, it's just insanity. Um, there are two million new brain injuries every year in the United States. So if you think about it, over the last 40 years, there's probably 80 million people walking around the United States that have had a significant brain injury. That's affecting them negatively in life, in love, at work, all kinds of reasons, and they don't know. They aren't able to trace it back to. Or they don't, think they, they don't it, even think about it. They don't about think it. about it. Right, because they end up seeing a psychiatrist who neither never asks or they ask once. And what I found is I have to ask people 10 times whether or not they've had head injury because they go, no, no, no. And I'm like, well, are you sure? And it's like, oh, when I was seven, I fell out of a second story window. It's like, do you think that counts? Maybe. And your and brain is soft. Go ahead, I'm sorry. And your skull is hard and your skull has sharp bony ridges and people don't get it. They think of the brain as firm, fixed and rubbery because that's how it is in an anatomy lab. Mm. But in a human skull, it's soft butter, tofu, custard, somewhere between egg whites and jello, and it houses your soul, your intelligence, every decision you make. And if you damage it, you begin to damage those things. And one study stands out. They looked at the homeless men in Toronto. 58% mm -hmm. of them had a significant brain injury before they were homeless. Really? 42% of the homeless women. Is that right? And it's a major cause of dementia. Nobody knows about it because they're not scanning people. And is it, Dr. Amen, not just perhaps the falling out of a window or off of a horse, but um, repeated little dings from sports? Like you, maybe you didn't pass out. Maybe you didn't have a concussion. Uh, but, but, you know, you're a hockey player, a football player, a soccer player, and you're continuing to get. So they looked at high school kids. Mm -hmm. They put sensors in their helmets, and they scanned them before the season and after the season. And what they found, sometimes the hits, where there was no loss of consciousness, they had the G-forces that were as bad as a head-on collision at 40 miles an wow. hour. Wow. And the white matter in the brain and white matter. So gray matter is, everybody's heard about that. It's the brain cell bodies. White matter are the nerve cell tracks. So think of white matter as the streets, as the bridges, as the freeways. Okay. Mm -hmm. And one season in high school disrupted white matter in the brain. Wow. 
without a concussion. Because wow. just what you were saying, it's the repetitive mm-hmm. hits. And Joe Lewis actually said that, the famous boxer. He said, it's not the big hits that give you dementia. It's the thousands of little hits. And one of my favorite all-time scams is Muhammad Ali. And his brain, and he won most of his fights, but his brain clearly was troubled. And those repeated hits part of what led to the Parkinson's? Yes. Yeah. And, and you know, another thing with head trauma we were sharing about our dogs um, is my dog just doesn't get it that I feed him. He leaves his toys on the stairs. And if <laughs> I'm not thoughtful, he is going to take me out. And you have to be thoughtful, especially the older you get, because what really kills older people? It's falls. Mm-hmm. And, and then it's brain bleeds or broken hips that then lead to um, blood clots and so on. So the thing to do for head trauma is don't, don't do it, yeah. <laughs> right? And we were talking about my friend, our friend, Shailene Johnson, and she got her scan and it didn't look good, and then two years later it's better. And every time we talk, we go over the 11 risk factors. And I'm just like, so what are you doing differently for head trauma? And she goes, I don't ski anymore. She says, I used to love to ski without a helmet because I'm a bit of a daredevil. And she's like, I just don't need to do that Forget because I love my brain. I know there are a lot of moms out there, particular and dads, um, who struggle with the sports question because of all the wonderful benefits of sports and being on teams and all the great things that, that come as a result of it. And I hope that as a society, um, we begin to incorporate some of this learning into our love of sports and our way of executing sports um, so that we aren't you know, unknowingly putting our kids at greater risk you know, when they're like 10, 12, 14 years old. Well, the American Youth Soccer Organization banned heading Mm -hmm. for children under 11. And I'm like, they don't like 11-year-olds? They don't like (laughs) 12-year-olds? When does the brain actually finish developing? It's like 25 in in girls, and it's more like 28 in boys, right? Both of us have boys and girls. And we sort of get that. Um, The... T is so important. It's so we're, we're talking bright minds, the mnemonic for risk factor, and we've done B-R-I-G-H. And now we have T, which are toxins. And they're everywhere. They're from the products you put on your body, uh, things like parabens and phthalates that steal your hormones, which we'll talk about. There's alcohol. We have this idea for many years, alcohol's a health food, and no, there's a direct correlation between alcohol and cancer. Yeah, he, um, he ruined this one for me with the red wine. <laughs> ruined. <laughs> Only because I love you. Ruined. And we just published a study on marijuana and how it accelerates aging, even though you know it's legal in 31 states and everybody thinks of it as innocuous. It's not. Um, and mold. Uh, we had talked about that, that mold exposure, if you had water damage in your house. I mean, you have to be careful. And so the simple things to do for toxins is avoid exposure and then support the four organs of detoxification. So um, water to flush stuff out through your kidneys, fiber to flush it out through your gut, Um, kill the alcohol so your liver is not bad, and eat brassicas, so those are detoxifying vegetables, and sweat with exercise and saunas. Interesting about saunas. Now, is there a danger in a sauna of heating up your brain, or is that okay? So, um, I hear you may go to Northern Europe. Yes. There's a study from Finland where people who took no saunas, so it was zero to one a week compared to three to five a week compared to five to seven a week. So, compared to none, Three times a week was associated with a 30% decreased risk in Alzheimer's disease. What? Five to seven times was associated with a 60% decrease risk of Alzheimer's disease. Because of the sweat? So get in the sauna. 
Um, it's not just that. Just that. It's also, it produces something called heat shock proteins that have an anti-inflammatory effect. And there's a study in JAMA Psychiatry. One sauna session was found to work as an antidepressant. Oh, that's amazing. Because likely the common the inflammation. That's that's really amazing. And what talk about hopeful and positive. There's so many simple no, things no pain. you can do. And I recommend this app for people called Think Dirty, um, where you can actually scan all of your personal products, and it'll tell you on a scale of 1 to 10 how quickly they're killing you. Whether it's <laughs> your sunscreen or your deodorant or anything. Right. So, so quickly on the other ones. Uh, M is mental health. So we, you brought it up that depression increases the mm -hmm. risk. So you got to take care of it. The second I is immunity and infections. There's a new study that just came out. 50% of people with Alzheimer's disease had herpes titers in it. So be very careful who you kiss. Um, I think infectious disease is going to be a whole subspecialty of psychiatry. N stands for neurohormone. So with immunity, you want to know your vitamin D level and make sure it's optimal, right? I never like normal, right? I don't want to be normal, because normal is a 50% risk of Alzheimer's disease at 85. Okay. I want to be in the optimal ranges, and for me, for vitamin D, it's 60 to 100. Um, so either get more sun or take the supplements, or both. Correct, and you know, just get the sun responsibly. Responsibly. Right, because getting burned is not good for you. Um, the N is neurohormone deficiencies. They're just rampant. So for women, it's often hormone replacement after 50. Um, you know, we don't want your levels like when you were 20, but we also don't want them like when you're 80. We want them to be healthy, and you only know if you measure them. Testosterone, mm -hmm. low testosterone is rampant, even in teenage boys. It's horrifying that's, because of that's head That's counterintuitive. It is because of head trauma and the toxins. Because, oh, wow. you know, the to things like parabens and phthalates, what they're called is endocrine disruptors. They're hormone disruptors. They steal your hormones, plus our high-sugar diet. If you want to drop your testosterone, just eat a couple of donuts. It'll drop your testosterone by 25%. And, you know, testosterone's involved in our libido. So I always say if you share the cheesecake at the restaurant, Nobody's getting dessert. When <laughs> no they dessert get home. when you get home. <laughs> so you'll um, remember that one. <laughs> so your hormones get them checked and then optimized. The D is the one I'm the worried about the most. It's diabetes. It's a combination. It's either or. You have high blood sugar, so you're either diabetic or pre-diabetic, or you're overweight or obese. Mm -hmm. And given that. 50% of us, according to JAMA, are diabetic or pre-diabetic. Whoa. And 70% of us are overweight or obese. It's the biggest brain drain in the history of the United States. Well, you say, and I always remember this, that the, the bigger the body, the smaller the brain. I published two studies that show as your weight goes up, the size of your brain goes down. And it's like, well, why would that be? The fat on your body is not your friend. It stores toxins, so that's a risk factor. Yep. It increases inflammatory chemicals. Mm. It's another risk factor. And it takes healthy testosterone and flips it into unhealthy, cancer-promoting forms of estrogen. And so you see all of these pregnant men in our society, you know, with the big, I'm like, dude, deliver the baby. This is not a good thing for you. And that's why, because I always like, why well, I'm a psychiatrist. Why do I really care about weight loss? And it's because our society is just going the wrong way. What is the formula of your waist size to your height? So your waist, you want it to be half your height. Or less. So or less. I'm 5'6", so that's 66 inches. My waist needs to be 33 inches or less. Wow. And that's actually a better predictor of health than your body mass index. That's so interesting to me. That's, and it's also really helpful that you've come up with this mnemonic to think about the risk factors with bright minds. That makes it much easier for us to understand and recall what they are so we can get on with the business of changing them. And S is sleep. And we found sleep apnea triples the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Triples the risk. And that is that we can men or women or is it, it different? On, it's the same. same. We can see it on scans. Their scans look like they have early 
Alzheimer's disease. So people that are watching this podcast, they go, all right, how do I know if I have sleep apnea? Obviously, you're, if you're sleeping with someone, they may know. If you're snoring, if you're stopping breathing. But you'll know if you're tired during the day. If you mm -hmm. never feel rested, and uh, you should have it checked. It's really important. And you need to make sleep a priority. So have a sleep study when you say have it checked? Yes. Yeah. Talk to your doctor about having a sleep study. Now, when we come back, we're going to talk about Lisa's care connection and some tips for people who are caring for people who have Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia. I will embrace my many strengths. I will not be tormented by my past. I will find the right balance. I will be calm and courageous. I will be free. I am not just bipolar. I am not just autism. I'm not just depression. I'm not just ADD. I am not just anxiety. I am not just OCD. I am not just PTSD. Welcome back. Uh, we're doing Alzheimer's Week with Lisa Gibbons, uh, author, television personality, um, social entrepreneur, philanthropist, and one of my friends who I adore. Ah, oh, that's my so favorite part. Thank you. I am so grateful that you're spending this time with me. Um, so, as you know personally, and your family knows, because you've been devastated by Alzheimer's disease. Yes. What are some of the challenges families face and what have you learned personally and then through your work helping other people? I mean, you know, in the Brain Warriors way, we actually talk about essence. It's why are, why are we here? What is our passion, our purpose, our deepest sense of meaning? And you really took this thing that was incredibly painful and have helped just tens of thousands of people. Oh, thank you. It, it was my lifeline, though, as you know. It was my salvation. And it was a promise I made to my mother who just, I didn't know what to do, and I was fumbling with this pain. And in the early stages, she said, Honey, you're a storyteller. You've, you've, that's, that's what you were trained to do, and that's what you're paid to do. All you have to do is tell the story. And it was such, she said, This is now your story. So tell it, make it count. And that's where I started, was to uh, not be in such denial, to not be ashamed, um, to own our family story, and that this is a tremendous part of my legacy. Not the getting Alzheimer's part, because I had the benefit of knowing things about my brain that I can change that generations before me didn't know, perhaps. Um, but to be able to uh, take this experience and, and open it up and I've been so blessed, uh, same with you, with so many, uh, you on a much grander scale, to be in contact with people who are so resilient. And I think that family caregivers has become my calling. Uh, I looked at, well, what can I do? What's my seat at the table? Um, you know, I'm just me. What difference can I make? And all those things we tell ourselves, right? While I didn't see a place for me in finding cures, that's up to the medical side of things. I can support research and raise money, which we do. Uh, but I thought, here's what we can really do. I looked at our family and I looked at how we fumbled through. And we all went to our corners to deal with our pain in our individual way. And we created in the world what we wish we'd had. And that was a place where family caregivers, the husbands and the wives, the sons, the daughters, could feel like they were seen, that somebody gets me, somebody knows what I'm going through. Uh, where we could focus on helping people call on their courage and summoning their strength to know that you can hold on to you uh, even while you're letting go of someone that you love. And that's really hard for people. So we look at 
um, you know, we look at education, we look at empowerment, we look at energy, those three things. How do we connect people to resources in their communities to help with that? How do we connect them to their own strength? And most importantly for what we've been able to do since 2002 is how do we connect people to each other so they can begin to feel more powerful, more confident, more competent in their journeys. And you get people helping people. We do. Um, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, say, for example, support group. Oh, I'm not the kind to join a support group. That's, that's just not me. Okay, fine. Let's meet you where you are. Um, but support can be an email with an anonymous person, a text with someone that you may never have to see face to face. It doesn't mean you have to join a group, although when people do, invariably they benefit from being uh, in, in community with others who can share their stories um, and share tips and share things that work. You know, when you're looking at the behaviors of people with Alzheimer's or the other dementias, um, they're very difficult, sometimes combative. Uh, people can be nasty. They can bring out knives. And, you know, it's, it's dark and it's very um, scary at times. So to know that other people have that experience, to understand what they did uh, to deal with it. I remember being at a party with my mom and she was in the early stages. She was wearing this beautiful sequin gown and I couldn't find her. And you know how people will wander and be distracted with dementia and I was panicking now, I couldn't find her. And my eyes darted to the corner of the room where my mother had proceeded to take the dress off. And this gown is puddled around her feet at the floor and my mother's standing there in her bra and panties. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I swoop in and I'm pulling the dress up going, mom, Mom, you know, what's the matter? And she goes, oh, well, this party is so boring. I'm ready to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> so there are those finding the humor and, and realizing that there were so many other people that saw that moment. And they weren't shaming and judging and feeling sorry. They were saying, gosh, this happened to me. Let me tell you about when Dad did this. And so you begin to learn strategies and you begin to feel that you're part of a team and not so alone. And when you share from your pain, it really, it, it's like there's a salve to that. It is an ointment that, that heals and soothes and that, that has full-on benefits. Um, you know, you have your warriors with your brain programs, and we have warriors of wellness um, because people who are caring, are, they're, they're, in, they're in the front line. And they're in a war. They're in a war. There's no question about it. Yes. Alzheimer's is clearly a war. It is. And you want to say, okay, who's, who's in my army? What's in my arsenal? What weapons do I have? And you have a lot of weapons, beginning with taking your oxygen first and fulfilling yourself, mind, body, soul, and spirit, and knowing that that is the way. You need to say that again. Take your oxygen first. So before you put the mask on your child or your honey... Um, no one wants to be that selfish person. It is not selfish. It is the best way to love and care for someone is to first say, let me make sure that I'm as full as I can be. I'm as well as I can be. I'm nourished mentally, physically, spiritually. I'm taking care of my finances. Because too often, women in particular will not spend the money on themselves. They right. won't go to the doctor and make sure they're okay because um, they want to spend all the time, energy, right. and resources. But that actually makes everybody worse. Better care for caregivers creates better outcomes for care receivers time and time again. And we have to remind each other of that. And we have to help change the culture um, of feeling guilty and turning that into a high five for you that you ask someone, can you sit with mom? I'm at the end of my rope. I need to go take a hike. I need to take a bath. Please don't knock on the door for 45 minutes. Can you please come cut the grass this week? Can you pick up the dry cleaning? Can you bring me a casserole? Because when someone says, gosh, how are you doing? Let me know if I can help you. Have an answer for them. Here's great. Thank you. Here's how you can help. Write it down. Give them a list. They want to help, but they really don't know how. They don't know. Mm -mm. And we have to teach people how to help us. The other thing that's happening with the caregiver is they're also grieving because okay. they're losing the person, even though they're not passed on, 
they're, they've lost the person who they know. So there's actually a high incidence of depression Very among high. the caregivers. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you need to take antidepressants, um, but addressing it is so critical and not being in denial that right. it's sad. And so having someone to talk to is important. And then making sure you're taking fish oil because head-to-head -head studies, fish oil versus Prozac, um, fish oil is actually a little bit more effective. Um, you need to learn not to believe every stupid thing you think. So yep. we call it killing the ants, the automatic negative thoughts. Head-to-head -head against antidepressants are equally effective. And like you said, you, you need to take a walk 45 minutes four times a week and you need to walk like you are late because that has been shown head to head against Zoloft equally effective at 12 weeks walking at 10 months beat the socks is it that amazing Zoloft. and so and walking with a buddy even better even better as long as you walk like you're late. <laughs> right. Like you're not having a really relaxed conversation. Well, it's interesting. If you only can walk a mile an hour when you're 80, you have a 90% chance you will not live until you're 90. But if you can walk three miles an hour when you're 80, you have a 90% chance you will live until 90. And so move out. Look at that. Um, That's really inspiring. Really inspiring. We have lots of great programs. Um, Dr. Amen has told me that I need to do more hand-eye coordination as a preventative um, to help increase blood flow to my brain and grow my cerebellum and all the rest. Um, and we do a lot of line dance classes at Lisa's Care Connection and um, you know humor therapy and laugh therapy. And there is something that will make sense in your life that you'll look forward to. Um, and begin to put yourself back in the picture. So many times when we'll say, well, how are you doing? The caregiver will respond, well, she's had a rough week and we were at the doctor, as though you didn't even ask how you were doing. They don't even see themselves in the scenario at all. So that's a big part of, uh, of what we try to accomplish is giving caregivers and permission. laughter decreases inflammatory markers. Bingo, Did there you, you go. ever read the book, um, The Anatomy of an Illness by Norman Cousins? Norman Cousins. Cousins. It's phenomenal. Yeah. And he had an autoimmune disorder, ankylosing spondylitis, and was in great pain. And he actually locked himself in a hotel room for like 500 hours with comedies and ended up not having the disease anymore and wrote this best-selling book that has really impacted the way I think about patients. Interesting. And you and I have talked before about music, and we see a lot of people diagnosed with Alzheimer's who, you know, the common reaction will be, you know, well, she can remember 30 years ago, but not 30 minutes ago. And so therefore the music from 30 years ago is very beneficial to calm down the agitated behavior, uh, to help you with those activities of daily living, like feeding and bathing and things that are so hard for caregivers. So we've started putting together customized playlists that remember that loved one is still a person they still have preferences, they still have that recess of memories, many of which are tied to music, that can really help you manage their experience and give everyone better quality of life. So before I have you tell people about Lisa's Care Connection, um, I want to tell you one of my beefs. When people go into a home or into a facility, they actually let them choose their own menu. And what they choose is simple carbs. Mashed potatoes and, and gravy? And spaghetti and dessert. And what they're doing is they're actually accelerating the illness. That you can, even in the later stages, accelerate or decelerate the illness by the healing environment you put the brain in. Even and in the final stages. Even in the final stages. And some people are going, I want to accelerate it. And I don't blame them because there's just not a quality yeah. of life. Let dad have the banana pudding for God's sake. Right. right. And at that point, let him have it. Um, if, if you've decided there's no hope for significant improvement, why fight? Um, but if if you're in the mild stages, at least for me, 
I'm fighting like heck. Um, even the moderate stages. And um, I'm sorry, because I have to do one more beef. <laughs> I knew you couldn't stick to one beef. <laughs> so many people diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease don't have don't it. Don't have it. And no one's looked at their brain. So Tana, when I first met her, one of the sneaky ways I got her to fall in love with me, I've learned this. If you want a beautiful woman to fall in love with you, do something wonderful for someone they love. And so her dad was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And they were actually estranged when she found out she didn't know what to do. And I'm like, well, I know what to do. Let me see him. And I scanned him, and he didn't have it. He had this thing we call pseudo-dementia, which is severe depression that masquerades as Alzheimer's that. disease. And six months later, he gave an all-day seminar at Mariner's Church. He completely normalized. And he ended up dying seven years later of leukemia in her arms, uh. fully awake, fully aware. And it was just beautiful. And you just wonder, I wonder how many people who get diagnosed with dementia by a paper and pencil test, and even they show, oh, normal atrophy for age on their MRI, and they've never had a functional scan, and they're just operating on the wrong diagnosis. Okay, I'm done. Well, no, but that I think that's, and, and some people are dehydrated. Some people, their thyroid's out of whack. Um, some people strokes. are infected, Inf like Chris, Chris Gofferson had Lyme the disease. The Lyme disease. So, that's one of my beefs, too, is um, people thinking, well, and they just get, they throw in the towel. They just say, well. And they're throwing away lives. And, and, and I'm not okay with that. You say not only can it be delayed, but sometimes reversed, like changes in your brain that can be reversed, certainly prevented. But focusing on that, being able to reverse things is very powerful for people. Yeah. So how can people find out more about Lisa's Care Connection? Thank you. Uh, our website is Lisa, it's L-E-E-Z-A, lisascareconnection.org. Um, we have a lot of uh, supportive information online. We have communities on both coasts. Uh, we have a, a program that I love called HUGS, which stands for Helping You Grow Strong, and it's peer-to-peer. -peer. It's what we've been talking about, that you know, people always come to us and they, they need help finding doctors and diagnostics and all the other side, clinical side, but they also need and want to find someone who, who understands what they're going through. And um, so that's when we hook them up with a hug ambassador. So there are um, lots of ways that I hope we can help, whether we have a center near you or not. So it's lisascareconnection.org, and there's a toll-free number there, too. 888-OK-LISA. Um, 888-OK-LISA. -OK right. Well, I adore you. I adore you back. And I'm so grateful you did this with me. I know our brain warriors will have loved it, and I hope they check out Lisa's Care Connection. Thanks, Dr. Raymond. Use the code PODCAST10 to get a 10% discount on a full evaluation at amonclinics.com or on our supplements at brainmdhealth.com. Thank you for listening to the Brain Warriors Way podcast. Go to iTunes and leave a review and you'll automatically be entered into a drawing to get a free signed copy of the Brain Warriors Way and the Brain Warriors Way cookbook we give away every month.